Hello. <laughs> I am Hi. your father. Hi. This is Aaron. And this is Almer from Toronto. And welcome to another episode of Das Criminal Podcast. And boy, do we have a doozy for you. Yeah, I'm so excited for this one. We get to go to South America again today. We've actually done two episodes in South America already, if you include the latter part of the Jules Rimé trophy episode, which visits Brazil. And the other episode, of course, was on the murder of Andres Escobar in Colombia. I think that was our fourth one. It was fourth or a while third. ago. Yeah. yeah. I feel like Latin America is too often just kind of glossed over in a lot of politics discussions, despite facing neocolonialism at every turn as the site of critical struggles for indigenous rights and working class movements and women's liberation. So I'm thankful that Amr keeps steering us back there. You're welcome. Yeah, uh, I've been wanting to do this particular case for a while. It's a bit of a dense one. Uh, so I decided, you know, better now than ever, really. So without further ado, I suppose we can begin. Let's go. It's a me, Mario. Oh, no, that's racist. That's racist against Italians. Yeah, so on September 21st, 1976, at roughly 9.35 a.m., the quiet Washington, D.C. air was pierced by the sound of a massive explosion. Earlier that day, Chilean activist Orlando Letelier picked up his colleague, Ronnie Moffat, and her husband of four months, Michael. Ronnie took her customary seat at the passenger side of the vehicle, while Michael sat beside her. They were taking their usual route to work. As the car rounded Sheridan Circle on Embassy Row in Washington, D.C., a bomb under the car exploded. The car was lifted off the ground and thrown into a Volkswagen parked illegally in front of the Irish embassy. Michael managed to escape the car through the broken rear window. As he stood up, he saw his wife stumble out. Assuming she was alright, he rushed to try and save Latelier. Legs severed, lower torso blown away, mumbling incoherently and drifting out of consciousness, Latelier seemed to absorb the worst of it. Emergency responders arrived and took both Letelier and Ronnie Moffat to George Washington University Medical Center. Letelier was pronounced dead at 9.50 a.m. Unfortunately, even though she stumbled out of the car, a piece of shrapnel had cut through Ronnie's carotid artery and larynx. She died at the same hospital at 10.37 a.m. Through several trials and appeals, some men were apprehended and found guilty of the assassination of Orlando Letelier, but documents show that the Chilean dictator, Augusto Pinochet, had personally ordered the hit to silence Atelier once and for all. Pinochet died in 2006, having never faced trial for his role in the murder. But who was Orlando Letelier and why did Augusto Pinochet fear him? Uh, we'll be diving into this dirty covert war against the left that marked the 70s and 80s in the Americas, spearheaded by a shadowy group under the aegis of Operation Condor. Ooh. Thanks for the sound effects. <laughs> so who in the world is Orlando Letelier? He was born in Temuco, Chile on April 13th, 1932, uh, being the youngest child of Orlando Letelier Ruiz and Ines del Solar. And during Letelier's entire childhood, which was from 1932 to, we'll say, 1952, Chile was primarily nationally governed by the Radical Party, which could be described as a center-left party. So Chile and lots of communities in Latin America had thriving socialist and Marxist movements at that time. To be totally honest, before doing the research for this episode, I think I was under the impression that Salvador Allende was exceptional, but that really isn't true. He was preceded by decades of a rising working class in Chile. Yeah, I agree. I think um, sometimes we fall into the rather easy trap of the great man of history uh, approach. But yeah, Allende was more or less a product of this working class than really an uh, instigator of sorts. Mm -hmm. 
So Letelier completed his secondary studies as a cadet in the Chilean Military Academy, but he abandoned his military career and instead became a research analyst in the copper industry. Um, It's important to know that Chile has a lot of copper. He didn't have a post-secondary degree, though. At this point, he married a woman by the name of Isabel Morel and had four children, and he was making really good money as a copper analyst, working in the newly formed copper office until 1959. Copper might not sound like a big deal, but copper ore and refined copper are some of Chile's biggest exports to this day. We depend on copper for building construction, transportation, and electronic devices. So the Chilean copper industry is extremely important to the Chilean economy and to building and manufacturing just in general. Yeah, you mentioned uh, electronic devices. Uh, Copper is a very, very, very good conductor of electricity. So a lot of wiring in a lot of um, electronics is made of copper. So it's very important for electronics. They used to do a lot of wiring in homes and businesses with copper as well. I don't think they do so much anymore. But I know in my city, people would find old abandoned houses and take out the copper wiring and melt it down and sell it. Yeah, yeah, that's where the concept of stripping wires down comes from. Yeah, I mean, it is valuable. Yeah, yeah. Letelier was fired in 1959, ostensibly for supporting Salvador Allende's unsuccessful bid for presidency that year, and due to the retaliation, fled with his family to Venezuela. And there he became a consultant to the Venezuelan finance ministry, specializing, of course, in copper. At this point, Venezuela had just overthrown a 10-year military dictatorship and restored democracy in the country. Yeah, Venezuela has a really interesting history of its own. We might do an episode on them. But yeah, that's where Letelier decided to go. He returned to Chile, however, in 1971 following the electoral success of Salvador Allende. Allende had called him to be appointed as ambassador to the United States for a while. And there he was tasked to advocate for the nationalization of Chilean copper. So the Chilean copper industry at this point up until before Allende, was a private enterprise run by various corporations. And one of Allende's campaign promises was to nationalize the copper industry under the Chilean government. And so not wanting to piss off the U.S., Letelier was sent as ambassador to make the case to the U.S. government to nationalize copper for Chile. If you have listened to our episodes on Mossadegh, you already know how this is going to go. So don't forget that at this point as well, The United States has already been involved in shady operations like Operation Ajax in Iran in 1953 and the chilling of Che Guevara in 1967, but these CIA interventions were still classified. People suspected, of course, but they were still classified. So, Orlando Letelier, bless his poor heart, much like Mossadegh before him, believed he might find an ally in the United States as a self-proclaimed beacon of democracy. He had no idea that he was basically dealing with a serpent. In retrospect, it's like watching a horror film where you know about the villain's evil intentions, but the protagonist has no clue. And you just want to shake him and yell, the United States is not your friend. Yeah, it's incredible how many different left-leaning or leftist figures in history turn to the U.S. assuming that, you know, or believing rather in the sort of national United States myth of like the the revolution of independence and all that stuff. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's depressing, yeah. yeah. It, it, like you said, it's like a horror movie where like, you just want to shout at the screen, being like, get away from them, they're the monster, they're the murderer. Yeah, Fidel had the right idea. Oh yeah, Fidel told Allende, like, arm your workers or they'll come after you. Yeah. So Letelier was eventually recalled from the US in 1973 and ended up serving as a Minister of Foreign Affairs, Interior, and Defense in successive positions. Up until, of course, the first 9-11, if you will, September 11th, 1973, when Augusto Pinochet, the general of the Chilean military, overthrows Salvador Allende. Allende makes a last stand in the presidential palace and is killed or commits suicide, depending on which story you choose to believe. Letelier ends up being the first high-ranking official of the Allende government arrested by the Pinochet regime and is shuffled around between various prisons and detention centers suffering severe torture before ending up in Ritoke concentration camp. 
I don't think the abuses of Pinochet's regime can really be understated. They had a fucking death squad called the Caravan of Death that flew around the country in helicopters hunting down communists. It's actually somewhat incredible that Letelier wasn't ultimately disappeared like so many of his comrades. Yes, yeah, speaking of which, so if you ever meet a libertarian or any sort of like hard right winger, and they, you know, they're wearing a t-shirt with a helicopter on it or make a helicopter joke, that stems from the Pinochet regime. They, what they used to do was, like you said, drive around the country in helicopters, and the way they would kill, that, kill communists is by throwing them off the helicopter. Oh, no. Yeah, so the helicopter jokes come from that. They, they take the leftists, they take them up, and they'd be, like, interrogating them, and then after they're done, they just throw them off the helicopter. That's sick. That's, yeah, depraved. Fortunately for Letelier, he made a lot of friends when he was in Venezuela, and Venezuelan politician Diego Araya ended up pressuring the sort of international scene, and the pressure led to the Chilean junta to release Letelier into exile after a year in prison. But upon his release, they basically warned him not to fuck around and not to criticize the Pinochet regime, or he will face severe consequences. Letelier moves to Venezuela, and after a couple of months there, moves to the U.S. in exile. So this is 1974 at this point, and Letelier ends up finding work as a senior fellow at the Institute of Policy Studies in Washington, D.C. He's also the director at the Transnational Institute, and also teaches at the School of International Service of American University at D.C., He ends up uh, in his free time writing countless articles criticizing the Chicago Boys and the sort of shock therapy doctrine applied to Chile. This is immeasurably irritating because people in exile are so often reduced to these wars of pens. And I'm not trying to diminish Letelier's work or articles whatsoever, but to point out that while Pinochet is literally running torture camps in Chile, His exiled opposition is stuck lecturing hungover undergrads in fucking Tenley Town. (laughs) I'm sorry, I I, I shouldn't laugh, but it's so, like, it's so grim. Yeah, I had a professor who was living in exile from a different country, not from Chile. But every time some thick-witted poli-sci bro would be like, wait, what's the difference between Sufism and Salafism again? You could see a look on this poor old man's face. Like, I can't believe I fled my country for this. It's oh, tragic. Man, that's fucking grim. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it, it shows you how, how much of a toll exile can take on you, honestly. Yeah. Well, I mean, Letelier did succeed um, in some ways. So he successfully lobbied uh, various governments to block several loans that countries were considering giving to Chile. One of these being a $63 million investment by the Dutch government into Chilean copper that he ended up successfully blocking. This work, especially this economic work, is what caused him to be targeted by Operation Condor. So Operation Condor is a U.S.-backed conservation effort to save various avian species in uh, national parks in the U.S. No, wait, no, kidding, joking. Uh, I wish it was that innocuous, but Operation Condor is actually a U.S.-backed covert operation um, that was running in the 70s and 80s with the sort of explicit aim of suppressing socialist, communist, or otherwise leftist elements in Latin America. Here we go again. Yes. Different decades, same story. Yeah. The main elements of Operation Condor was basically utilizing state terror and violence to suppress the left, including, but not limited to, political assassinations of particular persons of interest, um, disappearing and murdering thousands, imprisoning and exiling hundreds of thousands. And it was a transnational operation insofar as even if you were, say, a Chilean communist that fled to Brazil or to Argentina or to another country, you were still a target. I think, and this is not to downplay any part of it, but I think that the forced disappearances are the worst of it because closure in the sense of death and tragedy is really a myth, in my opinion, but there's a very distinct pain in highly suspecting that your loved one has been tortured and killed in this way, but not having their body or its location to prove that. And it just makes achieving justice nearly impossible. And instills an entire community with fear because could you imagine if your loved one leaves for work one day and just never comes home? 
That's a good point, and I want to add to that because I think disappearing people is even worse than killing them. I agree that closure is mostly a myth, but I think there is something to that because, like, if you're living in a dictatorship of some sort and you find the corpse of your loved one, right, your husband, your wife, they're a communist, they get killed, and you see the body, you know they're dead, you have nothing to lose, so you may be pushed into doing acts of resistance of your own or joining some right, resistance. radicalized by that. Yes. But if they're disappeared, there will always be a small, 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 small part of you, no matter how delusional, that still carries hope that they're alive somewhere in some prison. And if you behave, if you do everything right, if you don't, if you don't resist, if you do everything correctly, they won't be harmed. They'll end up being released eventually. You know yeah. they're not. Like rationally, you can say, oh, they're probably dead. But you still don't want to take that one zero, one in a million chance that they might be in a prison somewhere. Right. And when you throw someone in jail or execute them and say, we're executing this person because they advocated against the state or X, Y, Z, at least there's a reason for that. But when you just disappear people and don't say anything, then everyone doesn't even know what it is we're not supposed to be doing. So we think, I better just shut up and go away or I might be disappeared. I have to make myself as small and quiet as possible. Yeah, it's perpetual fear and like just a generalized sense of anxiety. You don't know who's listening. You don't know what you're not supposed to say and what you're supposed to say. And yeah, it's just fucking horrifying to live under. The Operation Condor covered most of Latin America, Chile, Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay. And all of these countries had at one time or another various military juntas running them with the backing of the U.S., of course. And part of the operation, like I mentioned, is it being extraterritorial. So state security in one country will cooperate with others to rendition people back to their origin countries to face, you know, torture and prison. The result of this operation was 60,000 plus people killed and over 400,000 imprisoned or exiled, or both imprisoned and exiled. Do you have a number for how many people were disappeared and have never surfaced? Because I know in the Lebanese Civil War, for instance, there are somewhere around 15,000, maybe 17,000 people who were disappeared, who are presumed dead, but have been not seen nor heard from in 30 years. I don't have any specific numbers generally for Condor, but I know in Argentina specifically, there are these mothers of the disappeared who like frequently protest in Buenos Aires. And I think they're the mothers of like 2000 disappeared men. Okay. Yeah. God, it's just tragic. Yeah. I mean, they still haven't gotten closure. There's no idea what happened to their children, their sons and daughters. My heart just breaks for them. Yeah. With Chile specifically, the operations were being conducted by the Dirección de Inteligencia Nacional, and I'm doing my best Spanish here. I thought that was good. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, yeah. Uh, From now on, I'm going to call them DINA, though. The Okay. Yeah, and they're basically the secret police. They're the bad guys. Yeah, we are anti-DINA on this podcast. I have a friend named Dina, though, and we like her. (laughs) If you're named Dina, yes. If you're an organization named Dina, no. Right. And they're the Mukhabarat, and they did most of the dirty shit. So one of the things they did was assassinate Allende's former commander-in-chief, General Carlos Prats, in Buenos Aires in 1974 with a car bomb. Dina, won't you blow? Dina, won't you blow? Dinah, won't you blow my that's car? That's fucking grim. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I laughed at that, but that's fucking grim. Might cut that out depending how many seltzers I've had when I edit this. No, no, don't cut it out. It's part of the charm, part of the episode charm. Okay. Sorry, guys. We've broken the fourth wall again. We try not to do that. Yeah, but we'll do once in a while, but you'll forgive us. So Carlos Prats was blown up by Dina. Yeah, with a car bomb. Um, In 1974 in Buenos Aires, he was living in exile, but, you know, uh, secret police kind of transcends borders. That's the whole point of a secret police. And Letelier's work in blocking economic investments in Chile was becoming a huge headache for Pinochet. So much like Ghostbusters, who are you going to call? Apparently Dina. As we said before, 
Letelier became a target, and as I said in the introduction, he ends up being blown up on September 21st, 1976 in Washington, D.C. And the bombs seem to have been placed under the driver's seat, targeting Letelier specifically, and he becomes the second notable Chilean exile to be murdered after General Prats, and the third overall, the third attempt overall after a failed attempt to kill uh, Bernardo Leighton in Italy. So I have a question. Given that it was 1976, and this was a car bomb, as you mentioned before in the introduction, right in front of the Irish embassy, do you think that anyone initially suspected this was related to the Troubles in Ireland and that Letelier was targeted by accident? And I ask this because it brings to mind that remarkable Edward Said interview where he discusses how immediately following the Oklahoma City bombing, News outlets reported that the incident had all the hallmarks of Islamic terrorism, but the bomber turned out to be a homegrown white guy. So based on my research for this episode, I didn't see any articles at the time, uh, like, you know, suspecting the IRA or any sort of Irish trouble link. My, the reason for that, I, I, I looked it up, and from what I understand, the reason that the, there wasn't a big suspicion from the get-go was because Letelier was such a notable Chilean exile, and because prior to that, General Pratt has been murdered in the same way with a car bomb, everyone immediately jumped to the idea that he was targeted by Pinochet. I feel like we should point out, too, that even with a targeted car bomb like this one that's placed under the driver's seat, You don't know who else is in the car, and you don't know who else is around. It's not like a sniper shooting someone in the head. There's almost always collateral damage. And there was in this point, Ronnie Moffat was killed. In the instance of Rassan Kanafani, his niece was in the car. She was killed. This stuff is not okay anyway, but I feel like we should just point out that these so-called targeted assassinations always have collateral damage. Yeah, yeah. I mean, passengers for one, but also like what happens when you blow up a car, chances are it's going to like, you know, go all over the place. And if you're a passenger, you'll probably get splattered. Yeah. It could start on fire. Someone could just be, I don't know, walking their dog nearby and be the victim of Operation Condor. What the fuck? Yeah. But I mean, I'm sure Pinochet and his friends, including one uh, Henry Kissinger, probably just write it down as like collateral damage. Sick. Yeah. So the FBI began investigating. Oh, thank God. (laughs) Honestly, researching this episode, I'm surprised they did anything. I'm surprised, like, they just wasn't like, all right, yeah, the car just had a gas leak. Well, I wonder if it had only been Orlando Letelier who died and not Ronnie Moffat, who sounds like a U.S. citizen, if they would have bothered. Yeah, probably. I'm sure there were pressure internationally to investigate, including from Venezuela and elsewhere. So, you know, they they investigate and they immediately discover that Michael Townley, um, this U.S. expat, was uh, at the time working as a contractor for the Chilean Dina. And he had organized this assassination on behalf of Pinochet. And they also find out that Townley had earlier orchestrated the assassination of Prats and the attempted assassination of Leighton. Uh, the latter, interestingly, collaborating with um, the Italian fascist and Gladio agent, Stefano de la Chiaie. I want to do an episode on Gladio and the assassinations in Italy. That's a whole other thing altogether. But yeah, Townley ends up being arrested by the FBI and extensively begins squealing for a deal, obviously. Okay, more, more questions are arising here. How the fuck does one become an independent contractor as a hitman? The United States government has denied that Townley ever worked as an agent for the CIA, but what else could you possibly put on your CV to convince the Pinochet regime to hire you as a freelance assassin? You can't just rock up to Santiago and get a job as a Chilean double O agent without any relevant experience. Yeah, like, what the fuck are your references? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, like, call my manager at Burger King. I'm sure they'll, they'll, they'll say how great work ethic I have. I don't buy that Michael Townley of Waterloo, Iowa, just stumbled upon this position. If found it in the newspaper. Fucking Michael Townley. You're, if your name is fucking Michael Townley and you're from fucking Iowa, literally everyone named Michael Townley from Iowa is a fucking CIA agent. That's like the most CIA name I've ever heard in my life. It's probably not his real name. <laughs> Probably, yeah. 
I imagine Michael Townley as a kind of guy who wears polos and chinos and tucks in his polos to his chinos. I just imagine him walking through Georgetown and someone says, what's your name? And he picks Michael because it's literally the most common man's name in the United States. And he sees a sound that says like the Georgetown cupcake sign. And he goes, J in town, Lee. Michael like, Townley. Like, like Passport 2 from around the world in 80 days, yeah. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll leave our listeners to make their own conclusions on whether he's a CIA agent or not. But him and fellow DINA agent Armando Fernandez Larios had met up with the Coordination of United Revolutionary Organization leadership, which sounds great, except, you know, it's a bunch of Cuban anti-Castro exiles that were pissed off that Castro took their slaves and their land. The leaders of these group, this group were, were Luis Posada Carrielas and Orlando Bosch, and they connected uh, Townley to a bunch of Cuban-Americans who ended up actually doing the assassination of Letelier. Of those, I'm going to list them now and describe what happened to them after. Jose Dionisio Suarez Esquivel was a fugitive until the 90s. He was apprehended by the U.S. and served a short sentence for the assassination. Virgilio Paz Romero, also a fugitive, also apprehended in the 90s and also served a, served a short sentence. Alvin Ross Diaz was captured immediately, found guilty of murder, sentenced to life imprisonment uh, before acquitted in a retrial. Guillermo Novo San Paul and Ignacio Novo San Paul were siblings. The former was sentenced to life, the second sentenced to eight years, both for the same murder. One for was for first degree, the other second degree. Or no, one for first degree, the second was conspiracy to commit murder. And both of them were acquitted along with Alvin in a retrial for it being a mistrial, apparently. Hmm. Isn't that funny, Amr? Funny. In 2013, the ACLU reported that thousands of people in the United States are serving life sentences for petty nonviolent crimes like shoplifting or possession of a crack pipe. But apparently, you can organize and carry out the hit of an exiled foreign diplomat who happens to lean left and by some miracle only serve a few years in prison. The right is acutely reduced prison sentences for me, but not for thee. Yeah, it's fucking insane. Like, this is an actual murder. And they're like, yep, all right, retrial. Whereas some poor guy is... The, remember the episode we did with the fucking... The, the, the forensic scientist who fucked, like, results up? Yeah, who just made things up, like... <laughs> yeah, and people ended up being in jail for, like, 20 to life based on his results. And if it wasn't for, like, you know, the ACLU and other organizations, they'd still be in prison because no one gives a damn. I think, too, and this is getting real tinfoil hat, so take it with a grain of salt. We talked about this before, and maybe in certain trials, the prosecuting attorneys, if they don't actually want to see these people go to prison, somehow, like, fuck it up. So then there's a retrial or a mistrial, and they're like, oh, shucks, well, looks like they get to go. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I know this, like, you say it sounds tinfoily, but, like... I'm sure it's happened. I'm sure this was an aspect of it. Like, I'm sure the attorneys for this trial, some guy in a suit showed up to their office one day with a briefcase. And he was like, so this is what you're going to do. You're going to fuck up the trial or we're going to fuck you up. And, you know. Yeah, just bungle up the evidence and then be like, oh, dear. Well, looks like they get to go back to Chile. Yeah, it's not that fucking hard to fuck up a trial. Like, especially if you're consciously doing it. So, yeah, of those, um, th those were their fates. And for Michael Townley, for testifying extensively, he ends up getting a deal. Guilty of one charge of conspiracy to commit murder. Ten-year sentence. And after five years of those ten years, he ends up being released into Witness Protection Program. Assuming Townley is still alive, he would be 77 years old right now. So he's probably just chilling on a beach somewhere, drinking Mai Tais and reminiscing about his days as a fascist assassin, which is fucking enraging. Oh yeah, I have no doubt that he stashed a bunch of money before he went to jail. People like that don't just not have a bank account somewhere with like millions of dollars. Yeah, and he also gets to assume a new identity and just basically become a new person, erase that past while everyone else is picking up the pieces, like the poor Moffat family and the Tellier family. Exactly. 
Yeah, uh, Larios, his uh, co-conspirator, ends up fleeing Chile later because he's afraid of being killed by the Pinochet government to cover up the murder. And on February 4th, 1987, he's apprehended by the U.S. He pleads guilty to one count of acting as accessory to murder, and the charges end up being dropped in exchange for further information. Hmm. It's incredible how many how many good deals you can do if you're a collaborator with a psychotic murderous regime. Yeah, right. But if you are poor and you steal something for your kid, you could go to jail for 20 years. It's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, and after you come out of jail, it's still on your record, so you can't get a job or rent an apartment or anything. And I mean ridiculous, not as in silly. I mean as in we should ridicule it. Yes, absolutely, yeah. Chile, of course, post Pinochet Chile in the 90s, um, after Ch- uh, Pinochet stepped down in 89, I believe. General M- Manuel Contreras was the f- head of Dina at the time, and he ends up being tried for the le- his role in the Letelier murder and sentenced to seven years in prison in 1993. And Brigadier Pedro Espinosa Bravo of Dina as well is sentenced to six years in 1993 for the same murder. Meanwhile, Pinochet ends up leaving Chile and moving to the UK under our, our good friend Margaret Thatcher's protection, and dying there, there without ever facing trial for the murder of Letelier, even though documents and testimony prove he ordered the killing himself. What was the phrase? Fascism loves company, birds of a feather? Yeah, Margaret Thatcher, God bless that woman, and her incredibly uh, soulless, disheveled look. What do you think Margaret Thatcher is saying right now? Nothing. Thankfully, she's dead. I'd like to think she's saying, ouch, stop poking me with those pitchforks. Ouch, it's very <laughs> hot in here. Ow, hey! <laughs> yeah, I wonder which circle of hell, because there's so many that are applicable. It reminds me of a Frankie Boyle joke where they were making fun of the... Apparently, like, her funeral cost, like, two million pounds or three million pounds or whatever. What? Now is the time for austerity. Yeah, not apparently not when you're dead. And Frankie Boyle's response to that was, for three million pounds, you can get everyone in Scotland a shovel, and they'll dig a hole so deep, they'll hand her over to Satan personally. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking yeah. love Frankie Boyle. She just sucks for so much. I mean, sheltering Pinochet is obviously an extremely sucky thing that she did, but... The list yeah. goes on and on. You want to know the funny on. part of this? Or not even There's the funny, a funny like, part. Well, no, not even, it's depressing as hell. During his stay in the UK, a Spanish judge ordered the extradition of Pinochet for crimes against humanity, and there was a warrant issued and everything, but Thatcher refused to extradite him. Uh, yeah, so with that, I guess we conclude our story, and I think it, I just want to discuss how. We need international socialist organizations, given how international fascism and capitalism work today. Like we looked at Condor and like how Condor worked across borders, Gladio in Italy, we touched up on that. And it shows how the U.S. imperialist state, and I don't, I want to go back on that because I don't even think it's the U.S. imperial, is a U.S. imperial state as such anymore. I think there's a global capitalist class and they use their security organs in various countries for the same purpose of maintaining their class uh, interests, if you will. Yeah, I think a lot of them are in the U.S. Yeah, like I think I think in this case, there was without a doubt a Chilean capitalist class that very much backed Pinochet, hook and claw up until the very end. And I think they backed them because they understood their class interests were aligned to his position and they were very much part of the same global capitalist uh, structure as the U.S. waspy types and the factory owners in fucking France or wherever or Brazil. And you, yeah. And it's important to point out that the owner of a copper mine in Chile has a lot more in common with the owner of a coal mine in West Virginia than a poor person in Chile. And the same goes for the other way around. Absolutely, 100%. I think that is a very, very important and salient point. How you relate to the economy, how the relations of, between you and how the economy works in your country 
means m- way more than like some arbitrary nationality or language. Like, like you said, like Chilean miners and coal miners in the Appalachian Mountains have way more in common than some fucking Joe Crowley type or fucking copper mine t- uh, owner type. And I think the interesting part of that is obviously the capitalist class needs muscle. It needs muscle to enforce its its uh, hegemony. And part of that globalization is globalizing the muscle. So instead of each independent security force being a silo, they work together, they collaborate. I mentioned earlier in this episode, Stefano de la Chiaie. He's, so Stefano de la Chiaie was a founder of a neo-fascist organization in Italy post-World War II. Uh, but more importantly, he was an agent of Operation Gladio, which was the equivalent of Condor in Italy, uh, collaborating with U.S. intelligence and Chilean Dina to murder an Allende ally, who was Leighton, who Leighton fled to Italy and he was like, yeah, I'm safe in Italy. It's far from Chile. No, it's not. These things transcend borders. The other thing I want to mention is how one of the things, I didn't mention this earlier, but part of Operation Condor, which was like, you know, extrajudicial assassinations and torture and killings, The U.S. basically hired a bunch of fascist Turks. Uh, They're called Grey Wolves, um, and that's the sort of name given to the Turkish deep state military apparatus. Basically, as a retirement plan, a Kashi retirement plan, they were hired to go to South America as part of Condor to do assassinations and murder. And I mean, we mentioned this before, but Letelier's murder was organized by anti-Castro Cuban fascists who were living in the U.S., being hired by a U.S. expat working for Chile's secret police. That shows you how international these things are. Oh, yeah. The fascists are already united and building coalitions across countries. And they don't try to hide it either. Like the Canadian identitarian types, you know, your Lauren Southerns, your Stefan Molinos, are in bed with the European xenophobes. And the Zionists and the Hindu nationalists have these bizarre love exchanges on Twitter, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen. And even within individual electoral communities, the so-called social and economic conservatives, so like your anti-abortion activists, if that's what they call themselves, and your neoliberals team up, even if their interests appear to be in direct conflict, because they care more about defeating the left than espousing any form of hypocrisy. It really doesn't bother them. So I don't think we need one single uniform left. And I don't think that's ever going to happen. But we do need to build solidarity movements because they're already doing it. Yeah, absolutely. I think you you mentioned the Canadian identitarian types. And I do want to add to that, that a lot of the Canadian right has been seen and revealed that they've literally flown to Ukraine to join Nazi paramilitaries there to fight Russia. It's insane. Yeah, but to to use some Chilean verbiage, I would say, El Pueblo Unido Hamas Ravencido. Yeah, and that's a great song, too. I fucking love that song. Yeah. So you fight capital with socialism, not with, you know, multi-ethnic capitalism or whatever. Um, The other aspect, and I touched on this earlier, where Castro's uh, encouragement or Castro's advice to Allende right before he was overthrown was arm your workers, arm your workers, the U.S. is coming for you. What do you think of that? I mean, there I think it's a point. I've never lived in Chile or Cuba, and I've never been to either. So I'm not going to, I don't have a lot to say there specifically. I'm not going to talk out of my ass about something I don't really know about. But I think it's a discussion to be had. But here in the United States, police forces literally have battle tanks. So I'm not totally sure what owning a shotgun is going to do for you. But as trite as it may sound, we can also arm ourselves with class consciousness. Uh, That sounds so annoying. But I mean, that's the weapon Orlando Letelier wielded. And Pinochet still considered this enough of a threat that he ordered Letelier be murdered. So I don't think books and pens can take the place of movements on the streets. But I also don't think an armed proletariat is effective unless the proletariat understands itself as such. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of people with guns. And we already have that in the United States. And look where it's gotten us. I mostly agree with that. I do think that arms without class consciousness just end up leading to reactionary militias like in the US and would Mm -hmm. probably be the same in Canada and Western Europe if the arms laws were laxed. 
I do want to raise an issue. I mean, I know that the police in the U.S. is very much militarized and they have battle tanks. But the one thing I've understood from history, at least personally, is that war is a people thing. It's not about technology. Like, it doesn't matter how advanced your tech is. At the end of the day, it's about what your goals are and how much you're willing to sacrifice to get them. That sounds trite, but... Uh, yeah, I think the biggest obstacle in the U.S. is class consciousness. I mean, the U.S. has the most amount of weapons of any country in the world per per capita, but there are no leftist armed organizations of any you know significant mobilizing strength. I do think that class consciousness must come first before we go into like the whole arm yourself spiel. Right, and historically speaking regime change or revolution or whatever label you might want to put on it, a large change to the structure of a government in a country, it really starts to occur when the army defects. So here in the United States, for instance, if all the soldiers laid down their guns and said, we're not going to fight these battles anymore, we're not going to enforce your imperialist regime, it would stop. The, the U.S. military is one of the most reactionary elements in the world, really. Oh, there's a ton of brainwashing that goes on, really. Oh, yeah, yeah. I would welcome if the United States Army like grew an individual class consciousness and said, we are workers and we're not going to work for this bullshit. That would be excellent. I don't see it happening, but... Yeah. No, but I do agree. I think a lot of success depends on army defections. That's what happened in a lot of successful revolutions. Like the 1917 Russian Revolution, the the turning point was the Cossacks refusing to fire on people marching in the streets. The French Revolution, similar similar outcome, refusal to fire. Egypt and during the Arab Spring, similar thing. The military refused to fire, and they said that they were uh, not stepping in, which basically signaled the end of Mubarak. Yeah, I think it's very important to understand that, like. For me personally, I advocate for workers to arm themselves, but I also think workers can't arm themselves until they see themselves as workers first. One more thing I wanted to mention today. One of the equivalents of our, our of the Letelier assassination, you might think that, you know, a car bomb is not subtle at all. But hey, there's less subtle ways of assassinating a journalist that's really annoying you. And if you're wondering what I'm talking about... I'm talking about our good friend, Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, who, as we all know from news two years ago, sent basically a hit squad of like 15 people to Turkey to kill and dismember this guy, Jamal Khashoggi, who was like, he wasn't even a fucking leftist or a radical. He was just... No. Yeah. He was a journalist in Saudi Arabia who was part and parcel of the system but just fell out with this particular faction of the ruling class. Um, He went to the U.S., he became a Washington Post journalist, and he was in Turkey, Um, he went to the consulate to get some paperwork, the Saudi consulate in Turkey, and these 15 guys beat him up, killed him, and basically hacked him apart with bone saws and buried his body in different areas. Uh, So yeah, apparently I just learned, um, also researching this uh, article, Bim Salman tried to do that again two months after the assassination of Jamal Khashoggi. A Saudi, like a former intelligence officer from Saudi residing in Toronto, uh, where I am, by the way, please don't send any hit squads <laughs> on me. I kind of like my limbs attached to my body. Yeah, this guy, like he's he knew all the secrets. He knows all the fucking like ops, the Saudi ops. You know, he was retired, living in the US and Bin Salman wanted him dead. He moved from the US to Canada and he sent these guys to Canada, and they were basically stopped at the border. And the, the, the way this happened is so fucking funny. Okay, so these 15 guys who were supposed to assassinate this intel guy, they all show up at the airport at the same time from the same flight, 15 of them. They split up mm-hmm. into smaller groups or individuals and try to enter through different uh, like customs booths or cubicles cues yeah yeah and they were asked if they know each other because you know not every day you get 15 saudis coming on the same flight and they're like no him no i don't know who this guy is and they immediately were shown pictures of themselves on social media on facebook where they were all pictured together i have flown directly from Riyadh to toronto before and i say with no exaggeration it was the worst flight of my entire life This woman just, like, abandoned her baby next to me. It was bizarre. (laughs) 
<laughs> oh, man. Yeah, because I had an empty seat. And you know when you're on a plane and the seat next to you is empty and you're like, yes, this is going to be greater than I expected because I have extra room. So someone else on the flight with like a baby, like a lap child, you know, you don't buy a ticket for a kid under two or something. You just hold it on your lap was like, oh, this is great. And she just put the baby there and went back to her seat where she could not see me. Like I could have been anyone. I could have been a human trafficker. And this woman just left her baby the entire flight. That's fucking bizarre. That's fucking disturbing. (laughs) And then the cabin crew asked me at one point, what I wanted to drink. And I said water or something because it's Saudi airlines, you can't get wine. And she said, do you want any milk? And I was like, no, why the fuck would I want milk? She's like, like, for the baby. I'm like, it's not my baby. I don't know whose baby this is. (laughs) You should have been like, I thought this is like part of your airline thing. You get a complimentary baby on flights. If I were not like a laid back person, I would have told the customs people in Toronto, I'd be like, look out for that lady. She tried to leave her baby with me. (laughs) Yeah, it's, oh, fuck me. Yeah. Also on Saudi Airlines, they do a prayer before you take off. They do the prophet's traveling prayer. Yeah, yeah, I know they do that in uh, the Kuwaiti Airlines as well. It's fucking awful. I noticed on Emirates too. Here's a tip for you guys if you have to fly Emirates. On the Arabic menu, under drinks, they had, like, water, juice, soda. But on the English menu, they had beer and wine. But they didn't put it in Arabic. Yeah, they don't want us to get ruined, you know? If you're an imbecile and you don't know how to speak English, uh, you're you're protected from the sins, the, the the liquid of Satan, the fluids of Iblis. But it's such an odd little thing for them to do. It's also very presumptive. Like, yeah, those right. English-speaking bastards are all, you know, degenerates, social degenerates. Yeah. yeah. Well, we have a new Patreon supporter. Yeah, thanks, GCAT. Growing our cult. So thanks for signing aboard. You will get access to all our archives of uh, Patreon episodes. Hope you enjoy. Yeah, if you guys want your own shout out, plus benefits like full length bonus episodes and chats about current events, or if you just want to support the show financially, You can check us out at patreon.com slash doscriminal. The link is always in the description. Yeah, and in um, new news, I have a Substack now, so I've decided to get back into writing. And Substack is a platform for writing newsletters, basically, with posts. Uh, It's called Safe and Qalam. And if you enjoy my invectives and my tone and voice and you want to read more of where that came from, uh, check out my Substack at Amer, A-A-M-E-R, dot substack dot com. We'll throw the link to that in the description as well. And please don't forget my international move and introduction to my new job are imminent. So if our episode schedule is a bit tangled in the upcoming weeks, that's why. Please don't worry about us or think we've forgotten about the show. Also, this move requires a two-week quarantine where I will literally be trapped in a room. So. Please, if you want to request a case, now is the time because I have not much to do except read. Speak now or forever hold your peace. You can find us on Instagram at Das Criminal Pod. We post photos, maps, stuff like that that relates to the episodes. Please rate, subscribe, and tell your friends. This podcast is marked as explicit on some podcast apps because we do discuss sensitive topics and use adult language, so that can make it harder for people to find our pod. So it really helps if you leave positive reviews because then DOS Criminal rises in the search algorithms, so people interested in cases we've covered who don't know about our pod will see our episode first and then hopefully listen to it and join our little cult. Yeah, as Bane said in The Dark Knight Rises... Fire rises, brother. So I hope that impression is good. So yeah, until next time, everyone. See you guys Monday. Bye. Bye.